Hi, it's Nikki here from Happy Hormones for Life. And today I'm really excited. We've got the lovely Susie Walker with us. Now, Susie, I first encountered when she was editor in chief of Psychology's magazine back in the day when I first started out my business, actually. So I probably stalked you for a while, but <laughs> trying to get uh -huh. the magazine. Um, but you've been on a bit of a journey since then. And you're now um, freelancing mainly for the Telegraph, Metro and Guardian. Yes. Um, but I see you most weeks in your Substack platform, which is your Heartleap Substack, which is um, incredible. And I'd recommend everyone go take a look. But first thing I want to do is, you know, those are the kind of headlines. Um, but you've been on a, a, an incredible journey over the last <laughs> few years. Um, and I'd love to, and I'm sure everyone would love to hear more about your journey if they don't know it already. Um, you're also one of the inspirational women I feature in my book because of this journey. Um, so please tell us what's happened to you in the last few years. Okay, so it's a kind of happy story because I think a lot of inspirational stories can start off with kind of doom and gloom. But um, so I was uh, editor in chief of psychologies, and then I had a sixteen-year-old son. I still have a sixteen-year-old son or a son who's now 20 but he came home one day and said mom I want to go to this amazing school in London and I was like what and um we lived in Sussex so it was going to be a four-hour commute and it was this amazing film school like run by the Bond people and the Harry Potter people and then I I don't know what <laughs> convinced me to do this but I thought I was trying to think of a way it was so expensive to live in London he was 16 so he couldn't sort of really, really live there on his own yet so I bought a canal boat and I um, moored it in central London in King's Cross. And we lived on a, a, a 42 foot, 100 year old canal boat in central London for a year and a half. And that was moved on in October 2019. <laughs> and we all not know what happened in March 2020. So we ended up on this tiny little canal boat in, um, in central London in the middle of lockdown which was absolutely incredible to be honest, because London was deserted. So we had literally, we had London to ourselves and you were allowed to go out and walk. So we would go to Trafalgar Square and go over the bridges and there was literally no one there. It was the most incredible time. And then I was kind of bonding with my 16 year old son. He, he struggled a little bit, obviously, but I'm um, stuck with his old mum. <laughs> but, um, but you know, but, you know, the happy, he's just graduated with the first from Farmouth University. So he went there, he, he was told he wouldn't get any GCSEs. He told he wasn't going to, he wasn't very academic. I think, I suspect a little bit dyslexic. His thing was always about making films. He did really, really well at the school. And then they took him on to, you know, to Falmouth. And he's just been voted as the top film that he's made. At, at, so it was really worth the sacrifice that we made. And also I was saying to a friend the other day is, once you'd have done a canal boat, we had to sort of get rid of all our stuff before we went on the canal boat. It changes everything because all of a sudden you, you're you kind of referencing that. So my son went to university and said, mom, it's so funny. They're all moaning that they haven't got like an ensuite bathroom to their room. He says, I was just happy we had a flushing toilet because <laughs> on the on the canal boat, we had to empty our own, literally empty our own toilet. And I remember when I first heard that, I, I said to this man, I said, oh, I, I'm not quite sure what's happening, but there's, there's something wrong with the toilet and it won't empty. And he kind of looked at me and said, you have to empty your own toilet. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and at that point I was like I don't know whether I can do this but no, we that's, had... a, that's a bonding moment isn't it where you have to and, empty that, and it was such a bonding moment because I said I said I looked at my son Charlie I said Charlie you've got to, you've got to do this I said I'll do everything else on the boat I'll, I'll literally clean I'll cook for you everything but you've got to empty the toilet and bless him he did so for the whole time practically he emptied the toilet so it was brilliant so, uh, so yeah, so then, so we went that and then um, I decided to leave Psychologies magazine. Um, I mean, it was quite, it was quite full on during the, the COVID time. Um, not only we were just trying to keep the magazine going because all of our sales used to come from a lot from commuters and from the airports. So our, our sales fell off a cliff. So I started a, a kind of a, a Facebook TV station and we created a podcast. And honestly, I was so exhausted by the time it finished and our budgets were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it was like, okay, it's time to time to make the leap. And I'd, I'd met a lovely man. So I let, met a lovely man who kind, who kind of helped me fix my canal, but it was like a rom-com, met the lovely man. And he said, 
will you come in a camper van with me? So Charlie had gone to university. I thought, oh my God, great. Let's go and have an adventure in a camper van. And we set off in a camper van together all the way around England. And I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I absolutely hated it. I couldn't stand it. It was just the worst. I mean, great for a weekend. Everyone who been had a camper van, really good. But try living in one with a man who you've just met. It wasn't ideal. Anyway, I don't know what possessed me. I think I was so desperate to get out of the camper van. I decided to buy a house with him in Northumberland. And we were in the Northumberland together for about three months. And then we split up. So I bought a house with a man. After, oh, my God. So I ended up in Northumberland with a splitting up. So I ended up, we ended up selling the house and managed to find myself a little, a little flat. And I was so heartbroken. I was heartbroken, not so much as a relationship. I mean, it was a fairly amicable split. We're like, this is not going to work. Is it? I'm like, no. And then we kind of split. And then, um, but I just, I was there alone, no friends, no work family. My son was in Falmouth, which is like 500 miles away. And I was like, oh my God, what have I done? And I really, it was really, 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 really difficult. And I, I did have some really kind of dark times and, and the flat was horrible and I had to do it up myself and it, that just wasn't my skill set. But I learned how to do it, I did it. And then, and, and in that moment, when we were splitting up, I decided that I had to do something. I had to find a way out of this. Otherwise it was only gonna spiral. It was only gonna go one way, spiral down. So I started a story festival when I was in it. So I've lived in this, be- I mean, the place where I live is amazing. It's got a castle and we're on the wild Northumberland coast. It's so beautiful. But what I realized, one of the reasons why I didn't like it in the camper van was there was no community and um you know there was no on the canal boat there was loads of community because we were all together and so that's why I loved it on the canal boat but with the you were constantly on the move all the time so what I realized one of my big ahas from all my adventures was how important community and connection are and and not just any connection not just washing up your your kind of you know, camping with your camping buddies it's actually deep connection that I needed so I thought okay I'm in Annick now what can I do to create connections? So I so I went to the bookshop, which is where I always go. Like, which is actually weirdly, I'm I'm working there one day a week now in this bookshop. But I went to this bookshop in Middleburn. I said, please let me, you know, come and work with you. She says, no, you can't. But you can come to this book launch that we're having. Came, went to the book launch, which was lovely, and then got sat. And she, the lady was so nice, uh, Trish. And she said, come, come to the pub afterwards. So I went to the pub afterwards, got sat next to the mayor of Anik, And I said, you've got to start a book festival. This is amazing. And she said, no, you do it. You start a book festival. <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> and um, so, so we, we, I mean, together we did. So I got the community together when we started the festival, but it saved me like creativity, connection, festival goers. And we're now just planning our third festival. We, um, we just had a second one in February. Um, so, I don't know, even when the your adventures take you on a dark turn, you can turn it around, I think, as well. So, yeah, it's been quite an adventure all the way. All Incredible. The way. Yeah. Incredible story. And, and and can I ask your age? Because this is this is important because it's it's in this midlife period when, you know, we do have these big transitions sometimes and, and we do want to change things for the better. But we sometimes have to go through quite rocky times don't we yeah I think you kind of go it go back before you move forward as well so I so I've really um thought about it I'm 56 so I mean I started this journey actually it's really interesting I've thought a lot about this about this kind of mid-period so at 50 I think the journey started at 50 when I on my 50th birthday I held a huge big party um and I said to my all my friends it's like okay I'm going to change my name to um I'd been married um, a long time ago and I still had his his name so I changed my name to Susie Walker it was Susie Grease wasn't it just in case anyone remembers I've been Susie Grease for a long time you know so it was on my I'd been a journalist it was my byline it was I had written a couple of books it was on there so I didn't want to change my name but oh yeah my my ex-husband was getting married again and I was like oh my god I can't have his name still and I was ready I was ready for a new start I gave up drinking completely no alcohol and I think I think I was just really ready for a new adventure, a new start, a new friend. And I think also 
with I mean I think giving up alcohol can have a massive impact on the way you feel um, and frees you from that awful kind of I don't know about anybody else but at, definitely at my age I mean I could drink <laughs> masses and it never affected me but as I got older and older and older I could just have one glass of wine and I used to feel so ill I mean one glass and I'd feel like I'd had 25 yeah. and I just thought why, and I used to think, well, if I have this kind of gin with this kind of tonic, I try to find ways. And I think, what am I doing? What am I doing? So that was a big thing as well. So I think in this six years, I've made this, I'm making, I think probably in the next year, the seventh, you know, th there's been a lot of change going on. And I feel like I'm still transforming. I'm still making this another big leap, you know, in my life. Um, so it's really interesting that it started there and and because if you have if you do have children and they go off it's I ha had no idea of the impact that would have on me I missed my son so much I only had one child and I was a single parent for most of his childhood so we it was me and him together and we and then we had this amazing experience on the canal boat together which brought us closer and obviously he was ready to go and as it should be, you know, to go out in the world. But, oh, my God, it was such a massive hole in my life. And it's taken me, he's just, just about to graduate. It's taken me three years to kind of bob up to the other side of it, of, of stop missing him badly every day. Yeah. And I mean, I've tried to do all my things of not being too needy. <laughs> I'm like, Can I go and see you every six weeks? It's like, Mom, you don't have to come and see me every six weeks. I'm new, I do. I <laughs> do. So. not about you it's about me yeah 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 it's difficult so. balance to strike isn't it um but oh my goodness I think you you I mean you literally are a different a different person to the six years ago aren't you yeah I, I am completely, everything yeah I am a completely different I feel that's what it feels like on every on every level um and it is I think it's it's but it's quite a, it's it got really difficult at the times. I felt really low and I felt really down and I felt really sad, all of those things. And it's just having the faith that you will there is there is rhyme and reason and what's going to be at the other side of it. Um, and I think that hormones can play such a as you know have a massive impact. And I up until that point I was managing the menopause naturally, um, but. And, and I was doing everything. I was doing yoga and, you know, uh, eating really well and obviously giving up drinking. So things were OK. But then my mood just hit the floor. And I thought that it was maybe just life circumstances. But then when I when I went to the doctors, they said, well, I you thought about HRT. And I thought, mm, I don't really like that. You know, my mum had died of breast cancer. I was a bit worried about it. And but she explained to me the risks. And I thought, well, I might as well give it a try. So I did, I tried HRT and my mood went, I'm just back to normal again. Yeah. So I think it was hormones. Yeah. So for me, um, trying hormones as well also helped my mood massively. Yeah. So you've restored that physical imbalance and then you're doing all you can to kind of restore that emotional health as well. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned kind of keeping the faith. What do you think your, your secret was there in terms of, you know, really just make, you know, trusting that things would work out where 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 do you think that came from with you well I think uh, there's a piece about someone's called about I read about it the other day and I thought oh yeah that's what it is I mean for me I suppose I lost a lot of my anchors all at the same time so mm -hmm. I lost my you know, someone after university my work family went my job and um, my relationship broke down and I wasn't in my home I, you know I'd moved 500 miles away from my hometown so all the anchors that kept me kind of rooted and the things that were important to me had gone so I think what I started to do was right I had to put down new anchors in my new life and find them um, and I think that helped me to give me those kind of slivers of hope wow. that though it's sometimes when you're anchorless and you're kind of drifting away in the sea you think oh my god where am I going and you feel buffeted you feel powerless and, and buffeted by the winds and you think oh, I don't know where I'm going to end up mm. and I think taking back control a little bit and knowing so for me that is your values going back to your core values for me creativity connection community 
and fun but are some of my core values so being able to sort of think okay how can I build some of those into this new life and then every time I put one down and then obviously for me finding a creating an environment so I'd moved into this really grotty flat that was just horrible and then to be able to you know decorate it and make it my own and make it my nest that was really important as well but I think it's asking yourself what are your anchors um, in your life that make you happy that make you feel fulfilled that connect you to you everyone's is going to be different with what is really important to you that is where you kind of start to gain a bit more control again Mm-hmm. and think okay that you know so if you if the sails flapping yeah. it's one well, it's really noisy and it's really scary and you can't kind of think straight but then once you kind of get your you've got your anchors down you can get the sail straight and then you can think okay that's the direction I want to go in and then once you you know once you've stopped the crisis so you know for me it was like you know do I need some HRT connect you know body body and do some yoga go to the bookshop get some connection let's find something let's find a direct and then I could start the festival because then you're kind of pointing in the right direction um so yeah it sounded like quite a lonely journey at times how did you deal with loneliness I know you you know connection came but it wasn't there for a while was it so no it was and, and that's exactly the right word it was really, really lonely. And um, so I, there's two, I went on two prongs. One, I thought, okay, this is a fantastic opportunity to learn how to be alone. So, and, and to look at the distinction between being lonely and being alone. And, and, and as many people listening to this will probably feel as well, sometimes you can be surrounded by people and still feel lonely or be in a relationship and still feel lonely so it's not about just anybody it's about finding real connection but I thought I needed to kind of walk the talk because my thing is always the connection with yourself so I did so much journaling to begin with I was journaling 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 writing 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 you know you know what made me happy and then again it was like getting that clarity of vision of like what it's almost like you're I'm using another metaphor here we did the water and now we're going to do birthing ourselves so it's like you're you're when you're you're literally birthing a new life for yourself I think at this age you're going you know you maybe you've given birth to children or you you've given birth to a creative project or whatever in our 20s and our 30s and our 40s and I think the 50s are almost about okay what do I want now in my life what what it's almost like you all your all your what's it's like your, your bits of your soul come back to yourself Mm, and then you're like okay okay what am I you know you're yeah and you're putting them all in in there and you're piecing them all together so I think this kind of I was trying to work that out it's like well you know I've been a chronic people pleaser all my life I've I've been very hard working a grafter and all of those things and often you know it can be a reason why I have been successful which has been because I've worked so hard but in a way, I do I really want to work six days a week anymore? No. I mean, that's why I left London is I was like, okay, I don't want to do that anymore. So it's it's kind of getting very clear about you maybe you know don't know what you what you don't want, but it's what you do want. Again, it's being able to know what di- what's your direction of travel and what does that look like? Um, and that only that for me is the connect the deep connection with yourself which is journaling, journey, meditating loads. Uh, in this, I mean, uh, the one thing I haven't mentioned is I also became a Buddhist <laughs> in the middle of all this. So um, I'd been to a, a Zen Buddhist, lots of Zen Buddhist retreats. A, f- a really good friend of mine was a Zen Buddhist. And I went to some really hot, when, when I was in the midst of the breakup with the man, I um, went to a kind of silent retreat where I literally had to ask, who am I to, to people across the room for four days oh (laughs) Oh my god so and then the idea is you know we all tell stories we all tell stories about who we are about identity and then you you know the person opposite's telling you all of their stories and then you go into your stories and I'm a little bit deaf so I can see the person opposite telling me and I can't quite hear what they're saying but I can see their face and the emotions they're going through and all of this and oh and I oh, oh, and this and this happened and then this happened and this and then I was doing the same you know and this happened oh and woe is me and blah, blah, blah. and you're going on and on and on and after four days you're so bored of yourself 
and it's just like you think really you know really go on and on and on yeah. and then you realize you're not your story you know which is ironic because you know I started a story festival and um you know my my whole my whole life has been about stories about the stories that we tell about ourselves and the stories we tell about other people so and that and then it's like well you know who are you if you're not your story and that for me was that kind of I suppose a spiritual awakening of oh I'm the force then do you know what I mean it's like then you kind of settle back when you're not all of this nonsense and these stories and oh, 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 oh who are you and then you could get really really still and it's like okay yeah and then you know I you know I'm not I'm not very skilled at that yet um even though I've been meditating forever um but being able to know that there is an alternative to the story that you're telling yourself, be it good or bad, is really good. Yeah. And um, so that, yeah, so, so that connection to yourself. Yeah, so, so, so important. And I talk a lot about meditating to just make, just quieten that noise in the brain, quieten those stories, because those are, that's the mind re reliving our past, basically, isn't it? That's the story we tell ourselves all the time. And it's, a, it's the excuse we also give for our behaviours in life, our choices, even though they're probably subconscious. Um, but just quietening all that noise, you're then able to go to live in actually just concentrate on the present moment. And that's where happiness actually lives, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't know how I mean, you discovered yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I, I think for me, I mean, I think why we all, well, why I certainly resist meditation is because what happens to me is the voices become, or the, the noise becomes so loud. And it can be sometimes not, I mean, God, you know, I've been in self-development for 30 years and still the noise can be really destructive. But I think once you can unhook from the story, so it's like, no, so now it's becoming, I'm a lot more curious rather than trying to avoid this thing that goes on in your head. The voices in our heads that, you know, you're no good, you know, you're not clever enough. To, it's not that they've gone away after all of this self-development I I'm just like oh that's an old story oh that's interesting that that's come oh that person really triggers that story in you that kind of so that I kind of go I'm a little bit more observing of it and also because of the the kind of a lot of the, the zen stuff I've been doing it's almost like oh and that's one story and, and you know sometimes you you get hooked by the drama of it still and I still sometimes still get hooked by the drama but it's more relaxing just to kind of try and drop it. And as you say, and when you do that, you drop down and then you're present. And as you say, that's all there is yeah. to be present yeah. right now, right and here. There's nothing to worry about, is there, when you're in that moment? There's nothing no. to worry about. You're not in your past, your future. And, and that's where you can really find some really deep peace there. Even if your life is chaotic, you can access that yeah. just by being quiet. It's incredibly useful. Um, yeah. Amazing. Um, tell us, I read a recent article where you described your the seven things that you've learned that helped you live a happier life. I'd love to go through them for our yes. listeners and our watchers. Yeah, yes. um, because they can just, you know, take what they can from each or, or whatever, whatever relates to them in their, in their lives right now. Because uh, I, I think it's a nice way of going through them. So give us your number one, if you have, have number one. Yeah. Oh, uh, when you stop growing, you start dying. So my thing is always don't, you know, don't choose the option that will make you contract. Um, I've got a really, really lovely old friend who's 82 and I see her life really, really contracting. You know, she's, you know, not going out so much on the bus up to Newcastle and da da da. And, you know, she's, she's on her way out really, you know, she's, and, and it's like, and then I have another friend who's our age and I said to her, and she was like, oh, I'm not going to do that. No, whatever you do, grow, do something. Even if it's you're not going to do the same thing, but it's too early to stop growing. It's too early to stay in your comfort zone. You know, I mean, don't, you don't have to make yourself really uncomfortable, but be learning and, and think, because otherwise, if we start contracting now, by the time, if we're lucky enough to get to our 80s, yeah, you no, know, we, our world will be for much, are we? No, yeah, and growing yeah. doesn't have to mean you know 
start a new dangerous sport. It just means, you know. I'll move on to a canal boat. Yeah. Do the oh, things, some of the that. things you've yeah. done, Susie. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. Learn a new skill or, you know, read something different or go to a new group or start making an, another a different friend or connection or whatever. It doesn't have to be yeah. massive, does it? Just these little things. Yeah. And that stimulates your brain and keeps your brain healthy too. So yeah, yeah, and also keeps you interested. I, I was uh, Esther Perel, who was a very famous uh, therapist. Um, she was our columnist for a while at Psychologies, and she she's done a lot of work on having affairs. And I think this, you know, I've got a lot of friends who've been married a long time. You know, who um, was either we're all divorced or they've been married twenty five years, and. You know, we we had a lot of questions at psychologies about, oh, I'm bored of my husband. And she would say, she was always saying, you know, if you're bored of your husband, you're probably bored of yourself. Mm. I think start there first. Always start with yourself. You know, how can you connect more deeply with yourself? How can you be more interesting to yourself? Go and make your life interesting before you start projecting on to other people. And I thought that was great advice. That's fantastic. What a good tip. I'm going to write that one down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing personal at all. Um, so what's number two? Uh, no, matter how, so ma- no matter how hard, feel your negative feelings and you will eventually feel better and get back into the flow of life. So this one, I think I have been... Um, you know, avoiding my negative feelings probably all my life. I when I when I was young, when I was um in my teens, I lost both my parents to cancer. So I think I I learned very early on, God, don't feel your feelings because it will destroy you. You won't be able to get out of this pit of despair. And that was a very, very old lesson that is not relevant anymore. So I think, you know, I spent a lot of my 20s drunk basically, <laughs> but trying to numb my feelings. And that I could get away with it in my 20s because I don't know you were um it was the year was doing that, it, that. Yeah, we were yeah. all doing it yeah. and all of that things but I think what I see when I see people trying to numb their feelings with be it busyness or alcohol or whatever it is to to you know codependency busyness you know it's I see how I've done it myself it's like we try and hide away from our feelings but you know again and all that the old adage of the only way um uh, through is is you know the, other, the only way to the other side is through and that it's by feeling your feelings and you will start to to your feelings are messengers again I was really privileged at psychologies to interview Julia Samuels who was um, she's a very famous therapist therapist Prince Harry's therapist although I'm not sure about that anyway uh, but she's brilliant she's an amazing woman and she said all your emotions are messengers they're trying to give you uh, message mm. and you know if you're feeling heartbroken it's like you know what are you where 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 is your heart broken and what are you what are you, what is it that you're missing and go towards that you know deep connection or whatever it is and try and find try and find what the message is from your feelings rather than running away from them because they'll just follow you that's all I found they'll just follow you and until you will feel them and that's you get kind of really tired of trying to outrun your feelings well, and the more you repress them, the more it impacts your physical health and you would just end up ill. So, yeah. Oh, brilliant. OK, what's number three? Uh, so the number three is um, always make the brave decision. Ooh. Always make the brave decision. So um, I one of my highest values is courage. So, um, you know, that's it go, that kind of fills in with number one. When you stop growing, you start dying. But if you if you make a brave decision rather than the safe decision I found in my life that that well even though it might not always go to plan you might end up in Northumberland with with uh in a scruffy flat you know trying to figure out what life is all about it will eventually take you in the right direction which takes you on to number four which is the wheel of fortune so I love tarot and I love the wheel of fortune card it says the bit of fortune is things will go up and they will go down. Um, and sometimes you can't change. You can't change the things that are going down. So you should just try and have a sense of humor about it, but know that it will go around again. So it, it helps you stop kind of believing that I'll be happy when I get there. 
And it's just trying to accept that things will go up and things will go down and it's okay. And you've just got to try and learn resilience um, and try and have some anchors. I think I was a little bit foolish in, in the, you know, I hadn't, when I came up here, no wonder I struggled because I had no anchors at all. Um, and that was quite difficult for me. Um, but I think if you, if you always kind of hold on to one anchor or a couple of anchors, um and learn how to get through the difficult times then you just have sometimes have to wait it out before the wheel of fortune goes back up again yeah yeah so yeah. you got rid of all your anchors and drifted out to sea in a storm i did you? i really did but i didn't really know i didn't really know that but maybe i needed to drift out out to sea for me to recalibrate sometimes uh, and- i do think that Susie. actually yeah. you need to honestly I've had a lot of stories about people just literally blowing everything up and then seeing where it all lands because it's going to land in a different shape and format and be yeah I mean I mean yeah there's going to be a lot of drama around that and I I don't think it needs to be like that I think you know it's like people say I'm going to leave my husband or I'm going to you know it doesn't need to be like that I think it's the it's actually the inner work you know it's like wherever you go there you are you know And it's the inner work that we need to do rather than, but I, it, the other thing is by, by doing, they call it in AA, doing a geographical, if you go to, you know, if you go to a different place, you think that you're going to change, but sometimes it is easier, I think, to change in a new place because you can, you know, you've got new horizons, you're doing different things. It's easier to create new habits in a new place. So I I do think that does help. And you can get rid of a little bit of your old identity that's, that's, stuck in that geographical place perhaps yeah. I don't know. yes yeah yeah no absolutely but I think it's also without the inner work you just end up in a new place with the old you yeah it's true so you, you need to sort of be really kind of looking at the, your beliefs that you have and how you recreate those and be shifting and working on those and I think that's sometimes really much easier in a new place because people don't know you mm. So if they, if you can sort of like, if you are going to have a new belief that you're an optimist and you're going to play, then you can just be optimistic in every communication that you have with everyone. Mm. So it's yeah. sometimes easier. Yeah, no. Uh, number five, this one's fun. Five. Yes. Okay, so this is the spirit. So I'm, I'm a great Star Wars fan. So always align with the force. May the force be with us all. And listen to your wise self versus your inner critic. So I think, for me, doing the Zen Buddhism, for me, um, meditating, and just as I said earlier, hearing those voices, you know, we have a critic, and we have the wise self, and, blah, 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 and all of these voices, and then when you were like, so what I call, people sometimes have no spiritual belief, and that's fine, but I believe almost like a, it's like a, the force is a, a an inner goodness, it's a kind of, that we will go back to that kind of homeostasis of the body, of the of the healthy way to back into the flow that that is my experience of it I'm not saying that it will be true for everyone but I think if you try it and you try and align with that kind of innate goodness that I think I believe is in everyone and then listen to the wise self rather than the inner critic and the one that says it's okay you can do this. You might not do it perfectly. It's going to be okay. It's inner parenting, really, parenting yourself. Um, then I think my experience with myself when with coaching clients is always that that you will. It is the it's the road to happiness. Oh, I totally agree with that. I think your that inner part of you. I don't know what to call it either, but that your wise woman, your inner inner wisdom that we're all born with that we kind of lose touch with over the years through modern life and whatever um if you can access that and usually it's through being still and meditating that's the one with the answers a lot of the time and you you know what to do a lot of the time it's just it's just you lose you lose connection with it and you're listening to the the mind of all the the negative voices and that's what takes over so getting into that still space is where you can access that inner wisdom. And that's what can really guide us and give us that compass back. Um, you can call it your gut instinct, I suppose, but that that's, that's how it turns out as well. That's how it manifests too, isn't it? In your gut. But again, you know, that can get mixed up with all, with other stuff too. So with physical health too. So 
Yeah, no, I totally, I, I love that one. I really love that one. What's well, also, you know, we, I was talking about anchors and, mm. and being able to, so sometimes there, there aren't any anchors around. So maybe for me, the whole, this whole journey was to be at sea and to the, the, find the anchor within, which was the, you know, perhaps I wouldn't have kind of dived into the, to the force so you know dramatically if I hadn't lost all my anchors yeah. because in a way that is to yeah. me the secret to the whole of the whole whole thing is you know align align with that and your wise self will tell you exactly what you need to do but you need you need to get very quiet to hear that voice because the voices can be it's quite noisy in there very noisy and also it's quite scary when you're in that unknown space isn't it I mean it must have been really terrifying for you with, with no anchors not knowing what was going to happen or where you know you, you didn't really have much to cling on to so that unknown space can be quite scary and we, we then sort of either run back or or um you know succumb to the negative voices don't we so it's also I guess I'm guessing because I've not been in that position that you've been in, but um, I'm guessing it's being comfortable with the unknown and kind of trusting the universe, if, if, if we want a better, another word, but trusting that things will turn out OK. And it, and I suppose, you know, that is the ultimate test of faith, isn't it? For mm -hmm. anyone, it's just like, but in a way, you've got no other option. You've got to just trust that just hang on and things will get better. Um and they usually and again, do. it's just a test of resilience, but at the same time, you are you are kind of setting sail for a whole new life, really, aren't you? That's what you're doing. Mm. So, you know, if you think about those old adventurers that used to set off and thought that the the, the, the globe was, you know, that it was flat, that the world was flat. You know, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's like your belief systems tell you that the world is a certain way. And you're saying, no, I believe that it might, that, that, that another possibility might be true for me. Yeah. And having faith in that possibility of a new world is, is what keeps you going. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it takes, it does go, going back to uh, number three, it takes a lot of courage yeah. to do that. And yeah. it's, it's incredibly scary. Yeah, it can be, can't it? Number six is about creativity. It's one of your values. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. Always find ways to be creative. Creative gets you back in, into the flow of life. So obviously I'm a writer. So for me, this was an easy one. But I mean, even if you're not a writer, it can be a creative solutions, you know. But I think if, I mean, I always say to everybody who is stuck or wants to kind of find themselves more interesting is do The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. Again, I've been so privileged to actually interview her. Um, but that book changed my life. Uh, many many times so if you get bored you know start with three pages of journaling every morning and do an artist date so those two tools so um just um get your pen write on a journal I feel really miserable you, so you don't have to edit yourself you don't have to sort of be there all kind of positive it's like oh I feel really grumpy I need a coffee Blah. and by the end of the three pages you'll have noticed what you're moaning about it's an awareness tool it's brilliant it's so great to be able to see what's making you happy what's making you unhappy all of those things and the other suggest thing she suggests is you do on an artist date so it can be you can go into a pottery class you know often people say oh I should go and you know go and listen to the opera but she says go and do something childlike and get back in touch with your your inner child and have some fun do you know stick leaves on a piece of paper whatever it is to find your kind of thing that will make you creative and and that everybody everybody without fail who does that course will get back into the flow of life and um, even if you don't see yourself as a creative or a writer or a musician just do it and see what happens. Everyone's got some creativity inside them, haven't they? I, I really believe that, even if you're a very logical kind of person, and you've, um, you, you, everyone needs to have some kind of creative expression, I think. Well, also, you know, it's also a creative way of thinking. It's thinking out the box. I mean, you know, now we're going into this kind of new world of AI. I think the more we, the more creative we can be about our thinking, the more chance we have of, you know, uh, creating a new world for ourselves in this strange new world that's going to about to to happen with AI. So I think if we can 
um, train ourselves to, well, what would be the opposite of that? What's a 180? This is what I normally do. What would be the opposite? What would be if I invited Marilyn Monroe to do this, if Barack Obama was going to do that, if they were going to give me advice? So you could do it even in, in different ways of trying to make a decision. You know, um, mm -hmm. if I believed that I was um, the sexiest woman in the planet, how would I go into this event? Or do you know I mean just playing around with different belief systems or being creative about the way we do things mm. and see what happens it's kind of it's just a way of judging it up a bit so you're not stuck in the same you know neural pathways of I do this I think that that gets me that yeah and find completely different ways of thinking mm. that will as we know completely take you in the new direction mm. love it love it and lastly what's your final yeah. tip uh, create a safe place to retreat to when it all gets too much so I bought in uh, on the boat I bought an electric blanket on the boat on the canal boat it was absolutely freezing in winter and um, but we managed to get into a, a, a marina where I could plug in uh, the boat for a while and I, I got an amazing electric blanket and I had this tiny tiny cabin that didn't even have a door it just had a curtain across and what I realized is that no matter how bad things go, if I could switch my electric blanket on and put the duvet across my head, I felt safe and fine. And the same happens when I got here. I didn't have any heating in the flat. It was February when I moved in. And I was like, oh, my God, this is terrible. But I just, um, you know, switched in the electric blanket, created a nest on the bed. And so I think when you're making these big leaps, when you're trying to, when you going way out of your comfort zone I think finding a place creating a place where you can rest um and a, a nest is well for me it's been essential for my mental health um and I think you know the place where you I think someone said to me oh you were resetting your nervous system and I'm like oh okay was that what I was doing okay great but it's just a place where you could feel at home with yourself and warm and comfortable and we all need that. <laughs> we all need yeah. that in this chaotic world. Thank yeah. you so much. Anything yeah. that we've missed that you wanted to give us an extra, give us an extra one if you've got any that well, I you've think, got hanging around. I think, I think really when we're in this kind of midlife reinvention or, re, re, or just like, even if you're just tweaking your direction slightly, I, I, what I would say is what if it was possible you know what if it what what if what you're thinking about and dreaming about was possible for you um i had an interview with susie ashworth who um wrote a book called infinite receiving and one of the things she asked was why not me yeah. and how would i say to everybody it's like why not you why why can't you finish the novel i'm trying to write a novel at the moment why why can't you um start a book festival why can't you um you know building your life i mean a lot of entrepreneurs are building you yeah. know why can't you get healthy and well um why can't, you know why not why why you know i in our writing group we've got some amazing people who have been dealing with severe illnesses and are on an amazing healing journey and are writing books about it and you just think yeah it's possible so i think holding the space for possibility is so exciting um but you know it, it it's going to be a, a scary journey as well mm. but if you know that I would rather be you know pointing my boat in the direction of hope and possibility versus staying on dry land and and you know the the, the yeah yeah I would yeah. yeah me too me too lovely thank you so much Susie it's been a privilege to talk to you where can people find out about you? Let's just get your website. In I'm there. the Heart Leap Substack because I'm building my own universe, Heart Leap Substack. So if you want to come and join us, we've got writing classes, we've got self-development classes all happening over there and just an amazing community of women who are brave. Just that I'm, I'm small fry compared to what they're doing. So we're all kind of joining together doing and we inspire each other and we're honest about how completely crappy we feel at times as well as scared and then sometimes in those moments you need someone to say it's okay you know you can do it yeah and, that, and it's all about community isn't it yeah 
Yeah. Nithi, thank you for all the work you do on the hormones and um and, and all the books that you're writing because that is a huge that has a huge impact on as well. So the physical piece, it, it, it's a like, piece, but we we need all that other pieces of work as well, don't we? Yes. We need to just make sure everything's working well. So. Thank you. Thank you so much again for your time, Susie. It's been a pleasure and I'll talk to you very soon. Take care.